Chapter Recording by Leonard Wilson. Chapter Seven. Joe felt the heavy lethargy rise from him like the removal of a blanket. His eyes became clear, and he saw the trees and the forest gloom. Slowly, he realized his actual position. He was a prisoner, lying helpless among his sleeping captors. Silvertip and the guard had fled into the woods, frightened by the appalling moan which they believed sounded their death knell, and Joe believed he might have fled himself had he been free. What could have caused that sound? He fought off the numbing chill that once again began to creep over him. He was wide awake now, his head was clear, and he resolved to retain his senses. He told himself there could be nothing supernatural in that wind, or wail, or whatever it was, which had risen murmuring from out the forest depths. Yet, despite his reasoning, Joe could not allay his fears. That thrilling cry haunted him. The frantic flight of an Indian brave, nay of a cunning, experienced chief, was not to be lightly considered. The savages were at home in these untracked wilds. Trained from infancy, to scent danger and to fight when they had an equal chance, they surely would not run without good cause. Joe knew that something moved under those dark trees. He had no idea what. It might be the fretting night wind, or a stealthy, prowling, soft-footed beast, or a savage alien to these wild Indians, and wilder than they by far. The chirp of a bird awoke the stillness. Night had given way to morning. Welcoming the light that was chasing away the gloom, Joe raised his head with a deep sigh of relief. As he did so, he saw a bush move. Then a shadow seemed to sink into the ground. He had seen an object lighter than the trees, darker than the gray background. Again, that strange sense of the nearness of something thrilled him. Moments passed to him long as hours. He saw a tall fern waver and tremble. A rabbit, or perhaps a snake, had brushed it. Other ferns moved, their tops agitated, perhaps by a faint breeze. No, that wavering line came straight toward him. It could not be the wind. It marked the course of a creeping, noiseless thing. It must be a panther crawling nearer and nearer. Joe opened his lips to awaken his captors, but could not speak. It was as if his heart had stopped beating. Twenty feet away the ferns were parted to disclose a white gleaming face, with eyes that seemingly glittered. Brawny shoulders were upraised, and then a tall, powerful man stood revealed. Lightly he stepped over the leaves into the little glade. He bent over the sleeping Indians. Once, twice, Three times a long blade swung high. One brave shuddered, another gave a sobbing gasp, and the third moved two fingers. Thus they passed from life to death. Wetzel! cried Joe. I reckon so, said the deliverer, his deep, calm voice contrasting strangely with what might have been expected from his aspect. Then, seeing Joe's head covered with blood, he continued, Able to get up? I'm not hurt, answered Joe, rising when his bonds had been cut. Brothers, I reckon, Wetzel said, bending over Jim. Yes, we're brothers. Wake up, Jim, wake up. We're saved. What? Who's that? cried Jim, sitting up and staring at Wetzel. This man has saved our lives. See, Jim, the Indians are dead. And, Jim, it's Wetzel, the hunter. You remember Jeff Lynn said I'd know him if I ever saw him, and— uh, What happened to Jeff? inquired Wetzel, interrupting. He had turned from Jim's grateful face. Jeff was on the first raft, and for all we know, he's now safe at Fort Henry. Our steersman was shot, and we were captured. Has the Shawnee anything against you boys? Why, yes, I guess so. I played a joke on him, took his shirt, put it on another fellow. Might just as well kick an engine. What is he again you? I don't know. Perhaps he did not like my talk to him, answered Jim. I am a preacher and have come west to teach the gospel to the Indians. 
they're good injuns now said wetzel pointing to the prostrate figures how did you find us eagerly asked joe run across your trail two days back and you've been following us the hunter nodded did you see anything of another band of indians a tall chief and jim girty were among them they've been arter me for two days i was following you when silvertip got wind of girty and his delawares the big chief was winging and i seen you pull girty's snows arter the delawares went i turned loose your dog and horse and lit out on your trail well, where are the delawares now i reckon they're nosing my back trail we must be getting silvertip will soon have a lot of engines here joe intended to ask the hunter about what had frightened the indians but despite his eager desire for information he refrained from doing so gertie and i did for you remarked wetzel examining joe's wound he's in a bad humor he got kicked a few days back then he had the skin pulled off in his nose somebody'll have to suffer well you fellers grab your rifles and we'll be starting for the fort joe shuddered as he leaned over one of the dusky forms to detach powder and bullet horn he had never seen a dead indian and the tense face the sightless vacant eyes made him shrink he shuddered again when he saw the hunter scalp his victims he shuddered the third time when he saw wetzel pick up silvertip's beautiful white eagle plume dabble it in a pool of blood and stick it in the bark of a tree bereft of its graceful beauty drooping with its gory burden the long feather was a deadly message it had been silvertip's pride it was now a challenge a menace to the shawnee chief come said wetzel leading the way into the forest shortly after daylight on the second day following the release of the downs brothers the hunter brushed through a thicket of alder and said thar's fort henry the boys were on the summit of a mountain from which the land sloped in a long incline of rolling ridges and gentle valleys like a green billowy sea until it rose again abruptly into a peak higher still than the one upon which they stood the broad ohio glistening in the sun lay at the base of the mountain upon the bluff overlooking the river and under the brow of the mountain lay the frontier fort in the clear atmosphere it stood out in bold relief a small low structure surrounded by a high stockade fence was all and yet it did not seem unworthy of its fame those watchful forbidding loopholes the blackened walls and timbers told the history of ten long bloody years the whole effect was one of menace as if the fort sent out a defiance to the wilderness and meant to protect the few dozen log cabins clustered on the hillside how will we ever get across that big river asked jim practically wade swim answered the hunter laconically and began the descent of the ridge an hour's rapid walking brought the three to the river depositing his rifle in a clump of willows and directing the boys to do the same with their guns the hunter splashed into the water his companions followed him into the shallow water and waded a hundred yards which brought them near the island that they now perceived hid the fort the hunter swam the remaining distance and climbing the bank looked back for the boys they were close behind him then he strode across the island perhaps a quarter of a mile wide we've a long swim here said wetzel waving his hand toward the main channel of the river good for it he inquired of joe since jim had not received any injuries during the short captivity and consequently showed more endurance good for anything answered joe with that coolness wetzel had been quick to observe in him the hunter cast a sharp glance at the lad's haggard face his bruised temple and his hair matted with blood in that look he read joe thoroughly had the young man known the result of that scrutiny he would have been pleased as well as puzzled for the hunter had said to himself a brave lad and the border fever is on him swim close to me said wetzel and he plunged into the river the task was accomplished without accident see the big cabin thar on the hillside thar's colonel zane in the door said wetzel as they neared the building several men joined the one who had been pointed out as the colonel 
It was evident the boys were the subject of their conversation. Presently Zane left the group and came toward them. The brothers saw a handsome, stalwart man in the prime of life. "'Well, Lou, what luck?' he said to Wetzel. Uh, "'Not much. I treed five engines, and two got away,' answered the hunter as he walked toward the fort. "'Lads, welcome to Fort Henry,' said Colonel Zane, a smile lighting his dark face. "'The others of your party arrived safely. They certainly will be overjoyed to see you.' Uh, "'Colonel Zane, I had a letter from my uncle to you,' replied Jim. "'But the Indians took that and everything else we had with us.' Oh, never mind the letter. I knew your uncle and your father, too. Come into the house and change those wet clothes. And you, my lad, have got an ugly knock on the head. Who gave you that? Jim Gertie. What? exclaimed the colonel. Jim Gertie did that. He was with a party of Delawares who ran across us. They were searching for Wetzel. Gertie with the Delawares? The devil's to pay now. And you say hunting Wetzel? I must learn more about this. It looks bad. But tell me, how did Gertie come to strike you? I pulled his nose. You did? Good, good, cried Colonel Sane heartily. By George, that's great. Uh, tell me, but wait until you are more comfortable. Your packs came safely on Jeff's raft, and you'll find them inside. As Joe followed the colonel, he heard one of the other men say, Like as two peas in a pod. Farther on he saw an Indian standing a little apart from the others. Hearing Joe's slight exclamation of surprise, he turned, disclosing a fine, manly countenance characterized by calm dignity. The Indian read the boy's thought. Er, uh, ye friend, he said in English. Oh, that's my Shawnee guide, Tommy Pomihala. He's a good fellow, although Jonathan and Wetzel declare the only good Indian is a dead one. Come right in here. There are your packs, and you'll find water outside the door. Thus saying, Colonel Zane led the brothers into a small room, brought out their packs, and left them. He came back presently with a couple of soft towels. Now you lads fix up a bit, and come out and meet my family, and tell us all about your adventure. By that time, dinner will be ready. Gee, Minnie, don't that towel remind you of home, said Joe, when the colonel had gone. From the looks of things, Colonel Zane means to have comfort here in the wilderness. He struck me as being a fine man. The boys were indeed glad to change the few articles of clothing the Indians had left them, and when they were shaved and dressed, they presented an entirely different appearance. Once more, they were twin brothers in costume and feature. Joe contrived, by brushing his hair down on his forehead, to conceal the discolored bump. I think I saw a charming girl, observed Joe. Suppose you did. What then? asked Jim severely. Why, nothing. See here, mayn't I admire a pretty girl if I want? No, you may not. Joe, will nothing ever cure you? I should think the thought of Miss Wells. Look here, Jim. She don't care. At least it's very little she cares. And I'm, I'm not worthy of her. Turn around and face me, said the young minister sharply. Joe turned and looked in his brother's eyes. Have you trifled with her as you have with so many others? Tell me. I know you don't lie. No. Then what do you mean? Well, nothing much, Jim, except I'm really not worthy of her. I'm no good, you know, and she ought to get a fellow like, like you. Absurd. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Never mind me. See here, don't you admire her? Why... Why, yes, stammered Jim, flushing a dark, guilty red at the direct question. Who could help admiring her? That's what I thought, and I know she admires you for qualities which I lack. Nell's like a tender vine just beginning to creep around and cling to something strong. She cares for me, but her love is like the vine. It, it may hurt her a little to tear that love away, but it won't kill her, and in the end it will be best for her. You need a good wife. What could I do with the woman? Go in and win her, Jim. Joe, you're sacrificing yourself again for me, cried Jim, white to the lips. It's wrong to yourself and wrong to her. I tell you, enough. Joe's voice cut in cold and sharp. Usually you influence me, but sometimes you can't. I say this. Nell will drift into your arms as surely as the leaf falls. It will not hurt her. will be best for her. 
Remember, she is yours for the winning. You do not say whether that will hurt you, whispered Jim. Come, we'll find Colonel Zane, said Joe, opening the door. They went out in the hallway which opened into the yard, as well as the larger room through which the colonel had first conducted them. As Jim, who was in advance, passed into this apartment, a trim figure entered from the yard. It was Nell, and she ran directly against him. Her face was flushed, her eyes were beaming with gladness, and she seemed the incarnation of girlish joy. Oh, Joe, was all she whispered. But the happiness and welcome in that whisper could never have been better expressed in longer speech. Then slightly, ever so slightly, she tilted her sweet face up to his. It all happened with a quickness of thought. In a single instant, Jim saw the radiant face, the outstretched hands, and heard the glad whisper. He knew that she had again mistaken him for Joe, but for his life he could not draw back his head. He had kissed her, and even as his lips thrilled with her tremulous caress, he flushed with the shame of his deceit. You're mistaken again. I'm Jim, he whispered. For a moment they stood staring into each other's eyes, slowly awakening to what had really happened, slowly conscious of a sweet, alluring power. Then Colonel Zane's cheery voice rang in their ears. Ah, oh, here's Nellie and your brother. Now, lads, tell me which is which. That's Jim, and I'm Joe, answered the latter. He appeared not to notice his brother, and his greeting to Nell was natural and hearty. For the moment she drew the attention of the others from them. Joe found himself listening to the congratulations of a number of people. Among the many names he remembered were those of Mrs. Zane, Silas Zane, and Major McCulloch. Then he found himself gazing at the most beautiful girl he had ever seen in his life. Uh, my only sister, Mrs. Alfred Clark, once Betty Zane, and the heroine of Fort Henry said Colonel Zane proudly, with his arm around the slender, dark-eyed girl. "'I would brave the Indians and the wilderness again for this pleasure,' replied Joe gallantly, as he bowed low over the little hand she cordially extended. "'Bess, is dinner ready?' inquired Colonel Zane of his comely wife. She nodded her head, and the Colonel led the way into the adjoining room. "'I know you boys must be hungry as bears.' During the meal, Colonel Zane questioned his guests about their journey, and as to the treatment they had received at the hands of the Indians. He smiled at the young minister's earnestness in regard to the conversion of the red men, and he laughed outright when Joe said he guessed he came to the frontier because it was too slow at home. "'I am sure your desire for excitement will soon be satisfied, if indeed it be not so already,' remarked the Colonel. But as to the realization of your brother's hopes, I am not so sanguine. Undoubtedly, the Moravian missionaries have accomplished wonders with the Indians. Not long ago I visited the village of Peace, the Indian name for the mission, and was struck by the friendliness and industry which prevailed there. Truly it was a village of peace. Yet it is almost too early to be certain of permanent success of this work. The Indian's nature is one hard to understand. He is naturally roving and restless, which, however, may be owing to his habit of moving from place to place in search of good hunting grounds. I believe, though I must confess I haven't seen any pioneers who share my belief, that the savage has a beautiful side to his character. I know of many noble deeds done by them, and I believe, if they are honestly dealt with, they will return good for good. There are bad ones, of course, but the French traders, and men like the Gerties, have caused most of this long war. Jonathan and Wetzel tell me the Shawnees and Chippewas have taken the warpath again. Then the fact that the Gerties are with the Delawares is reason for alarm. We have been comparatively quiet here of late. Did you boys learn to what tribe your captors belong? Did Wetzel say? He did not. He spoke a little, but I will say he was exceedingly active, answered Joe with a smile. To have seen Wetzel fight Indians is something you are not likely to forget, said Colonel Zane grimly. Now tell me, how did those Indians wear their scalp lock? Uh, their heads were shaved closely, with the exception of a little place on top, 
The remaining hair was twisted into a tuft, tied tightly, and into this had been thrust a couple of painted pins. When Wetzel scalped the Indians, the pins fell out. I picked one up and found it to be bone. "'You will make a woodsman, that's certain,' replied Colonel Zane. "'The Indians were Shawnee on the warpath. "'Well, we will not borrow trouble, for when it comes in the shape of redskins, "'it usually comes quickly.' Mr. Wells seemed anxious to resume the journey down the river, but I shall try to persuade him to remain with us a while. Indeed, I am sorry I cannot keep you all here at Fort Henry, and more especially the girls. On the border we need young people, and while I do not want to frighten the women, I fear there will be more than Indians fighting for them. I hope not, but we have come prepared for anything, said Kate, with a quiet smile. Our home was with Uncle, and when he announced his intention of going west, we decided our duty was to go with him. You were right, and I hope you will find a happy home, rejoined Colonel Zane. If life among the Indians proves to be too hard, we shall welcome you here. Betty, show the girls your pets and Indian trinkets. I am going to take the boys to Silas's cabin to see Mr. Wells, and then show them over the fort. As they went out, Joe saw the Indian guide standing in exactly the same position as when they entered the building. "'Can't that Indian move?' he asked curiously. "'He can cover one hundred miles in a day when he wants to,' replied Colonel Zane. "'He's resting now. An Indian will often stand or sit in one position for many hours.' "'He's a fine-looking chap,' remarked Joe, and then to himself. "'But I don't like him. I guess I'm prejudiced.' You learn to like Tome, as we call him. Colonel Zane, I want a light for my pipe. I haven't had a smoke since the day we were captured. That blamed redskin took my tobacco. It's lucky I had some in my other pack. I'd like to meet him again, also Silvertip and that brute Gertie. My lad, don't make such wishes, said Colonel Zane earnestly. You were indeed fortunate to escape, and I can well understand your feelings. There's nothing I should like better than to see Gertie over the sights of my rifle. But I never hunt after danger, and to look for Gertie is to court death. But Wetzel, ah, my lad, I know, Wetzel goes alone in the woods. But then he is different from other men. Before you leave, I will tell you all about him. Colonel Zane went around the corner of the cabin and returned with a live coal on a chip of wood, which Joe placed in the bowl of his pipe and because of the strong breeze stepped close to the cabin wall. Being a keen observer, he noticed many small round holes in the logs. They were so near together that the timbers had an odd speckled appearance, and there was hardly a place where he could have put his thumb without covering a hole. At first he thought they were made by a worm or bird peculiar to that region, but finally he concluded that they were bullet holes. He thrust his knife blade into one, and out rolled a leaden ball. I'd like to have been here when these were made, he said. Well, at the time, I wished I was back on the Potomac, replied Colonel Zane. They found the old missionary on the doorstep of the adjacent cabin. He appeared discouraged when Colonel Zane interrogated him, and said that he was impatient because of the delay. Mr. Wells, is it not possible that you underrate the danger of your enterprise? I fear not but the Lord, answered the old man. Do not you fear for those with you, went on the colonel earnestly. I am heart and soul with you in your work, but want to impress upon you that the time is not propitious. It is a long journey to the village, and the way is beset with dangers of which you have no idea. Will you not remain here with me for a few weeks, or at least until my scouts report? I thank you, but go I will. Then let me entreat you to remain here a few days, so that I may send my brother Jonathan and Wetzel with you. If any can guide you safely to the village of peace, it will be they. At this moment Joe saw two men approaching from the fort, and recognized one of them as Wetzel. He doubted not that the other was Lord Dunmore's famous guide and hunter, Jonathan Zane. In features he resembled the colonel, and was as tall as Wetzel although not so muscular or wide of chest. Joe felt the same thrill he had experienced while watching the frontiersmen at Fort Pitt. Wetzel and Jonathan spoke a word to Colonel Zane, and then stepped aside. 
the hunters stood lithe and erect with the easy graceful poise of indians we'll take two canoes day after tomorrow said jonathan decisively to colonel zane have you a rifle for wetzel the delaware's got his colonel zane pondered over the question rifles were not scarce at the fort but a weapon that wetzel would use was hard to find the hunter may have my rifle said the old missionary i have no use for a weapon with which to destroy god's creatures my brother was a frontiersman he left this rifle to me i remember hearing him say once that if a man knew exactly the weight of lead and power needed it would shoot absolutely true he went into the cabin and presently came out with a long object wrapped in linsey cloths unwinding the coverings he brought to view a rifle the proportions of which caused jonathan's eyes to glisten and brought an exclamation from colonel zane wetzel balanced the gun in his hands it was fully six feet long the barrel was large and the dark steel finely polished the stock was black walnut ornamented with silver trimmings using jonathan's powder flask and bullet pouch wetzel proceeded to load the weapon he poured out a quantity of powder into the palm of his hand performing the action quickly and dexterously but was so slow while measuring it that joe wondered if he were counting the grains next he selected a bullet out of a dozen which jonathan held toward him he examined it carefully and tried it in the muzzle of the rifle evidently it did not please him for he took another finally he scraped a bullet with his knife and placing it in the centre of a small linsey rag deftly forced it down he adjusted the flint dropped a few grains of powder in the pan and then looked around for a mark at which to shoot joe observed that the hunters and colonel zane were as serious regarding the work as if at that moment some important issue depended upon the accuracy of the rifle there lou there's a good shot it's pretty far even for you when you don't know the gun said colonel zane pointing toward the river joe saw the end of a log about the size of a man's head sticking out of the water perhaps a hundred and fifty yards distant he thought to hit it would be a fine shot but was amazed when he heard colonel zane say to several men who had joined the group that wetzel intended to shoot at a turtle on the log by straining his eyes joe succeeded in distinguishing a small lump which he concluded was the turtle wetzel took a step forward the long black rifle was raised with a stately sweep the instant it reached a level a thread of flame burst forth followed by a peculiarly clear ringing report did he hit it asked colonel zane eagerly as a boy i allow he did answered jonathan i'll go and see said joe he ran down the bank along the beach and stepped on the log he saw a turtle about the size of an ordinary saucer picking it up he saw a bullet hole in the shell near the middle the bullet had gone through the turtle and it was quite dead joe carried it to the waiting group i allowed so declared jonathan wetzel examined the turtle and turning to the old missionary said your brother spoke the truth and i thank you for the rifle end of chapter seven of the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson of springfield ohio chapter eight of the spirit of the border by zane gray recording by leonard wilson chapter eight so you want to know all about wetzel inquired colonel zane of joe when having left jim and mr wells they returned to the cabin i am immensely interested in him replied joe well i don't think there's anything singular in that i know wetzel better perhaps than any man living but i've seldom talked about him he doesn't like it he is by birth a virginian i should say forty years old we were boys together and i'm a little beyond that age he was like any of the lads except that he excelled us all in strength and agility when he was nearly eighteen years old a band of indians delawares i think crossed the border on a marauding expedition far into virginia they burned the old wetzel homestead and murdered the father mother two sisters and a baby brother 
the terrible shock nearly killed lewis who for a time was very ill when he recovered he went in search of his brothers martin and john wetzel who were hunting and brought them back to their desolated home over the ashes of the home and the graves of the loved ones the brothers swore sleepless and eternal vengeance the elder brothers have been devoted all these twenty years and more to the killing of indians but lewis has been the great foe of the red man you have already seen an example of his deeds and will hear of more his name is a household word on the border scores of times he has saved actually saved this fort and its settlement his knowledge of savage ways surpasses by far boone's major mcculloch's jonathan's or any of the hunters then hunting indians is his sole occupation he lives for that purpose alone he is very seldom in the settlement sometimes he stays here a few days especially if he is needed but usually he roams the forest Oh, what did Jeff Lynn mean when he said that some people think Wetzel is crazy? There are many who think the man mad, but I do not. When the passion for Indian hunting comes upon him, he is fierce, almost frenzied, yet perfectly sane. While here he's quiet, seldom speaks except when spoken to, and is taciturn with strangers. He often comes to my cabin and sits beside the fire for hours, I think he finds pleasure in the conversation and laughter of friends. He is fond of the children, and would do anything for my sister Betty. His life must be lonely and sad, remarked Joe. The life of any border man is that, but Wetzel's is particularly so. What is he called by the Indians? They call him Atalang, or in English, Death Wind. By George, that's what Silvertip said in French, le vent de la mort. Yes, you have it right. A French fur trader gave Wetzel that name years ago, and it has clung to him. The Indians say the death wind blows through the forest whenever Wetzel stalks on their trail. Colonel Zane, don't you think me superstitious, whispered Joe, leaning toward the colonel, but I heard that wind blow through the forest what ejaculated colonel zane he saw that joe was in earnest for the remembrance of the moan had more than once paled his cheek and caused beads of perspiration to collect on his brow joe related the circumstances of that night and at the end of his narrative colonel zane sat silent and thoughtful you don't think it was wetzel who moaned he asked at length no i don't replied joe quickly but colonel zane i heard that moan as plainly as i can hear your voice i heard it twice now what was it jonathan said the same thing to me once he had been out hunting with wetzel they separated and during the night jonathan heard the wind the next day he ran across a dead indian he believes wetzel makes the noise and so do the hunters but i think it is simply the moan of the night wind through the trees i have heard it at times when my very blood seemingly ran cold well i tried to think it was the wind soughing through the pines but i'm afraid i didn't succeed very well anyhow i knew wetzel instantly just as jeff lynn said i would he killed those indians in an instant and he must have an iron arm wetzel excels in strength and speed any man red or white on the frontier he can run away from Jonathan, who is as swift as an Indian. He's stronger than any of the other men. I remember one day old Hugh Bennett's wagon wheels stuck in a bog down by the creek. Hugh tried, as several others did, to move the wheels, but they couldn't be made to budge. Along came Wetzel, pushed away the men, and lifted the wagon unaided. It would take hours to tell you about him. In brief, among all the border scouts and hunters, Wetzel stands alone. No wonder the Indians fear him. He is as swift as an eagle, strong as mountain ash, keen as a fox, and absolutely tireless and implacable. How long have you been here, Colonel Zane? More than twelve years, and it has been one long fight. I'm afraid I'm too late for the fun, said Joe, with his quiet laugh. 
"'Not by about twelve more years,' answered Colonel Zane, studying expression on Joe's face. "'When I came out here years ago, I had the same adventurous spirit which I see in you. It has been considerably quelled, however. I have seen many a daring young fellow get the border fever, and with it his death. Let me advise you to learn the ways of the hunters, to watch someone skilled in woodcraft. Perhaps Wetzel himself will take you in hand. I don't mind saying that he spoke of you to me in a tone I never heard Lou use before. He did, questioned Joe eagerly, flushing with pleasure. Do you think he'd take me out? Dare I ask him? Don't be impatient. Perhaps I can arrange it. Come over here now to Metzer's place. I want to make you acquainted with him. These boys have all been cutting timber. They have just come in for dinner. Be easy and quiet with them. Then you'll get on. Colonel Zane introduced Joe to five sturdy boys and left him in their company. Joe sat down on a log outside a cabin and leisurely surveyed the young men. They all looked about the same, strong without being heavy, light-haired, and bronze-faced. In their turn, they carefully judged Joe. A newcomer from the east was always regarded with some doubt. If they expected to hear Joe talk much, they were mistaken. He appeared good-natured, but not too friendly. "'Fine weather we're having,' said Dick Metzger. "'Fine,' agreed Joe, laconically. "'Like frontier life?' sure a silence ensued after this breaking of the ice the boys were awaiting their turn at a little wooden bench upon which stood a bucket of water and a basin here you got catched by some shawnees remarked another youth as he rolled up his shirt sleeves they all looked at joe now it was not improbable their estimate of him would be greatly influenced by the way he answered this question yes was captive for three days did you knock any redskins over? This question was artfully put to draw Joe out. Above all things, the border men detested boastfulness. Tried on Joe, the ruse failed signally. I was scared speechless most of the time, answered Joe with his pleasant smile. By gosh, I don't blame you, burst out Will Metzer. I had that experience once, and once's enough. The boys laughed and looked in a more friendly manner at Joe. Though he said he had been frightened, his cool and careless manner belied his words. In Joe's low voice and clear gray eye, there was something potent and magnetic, which subtly influenced those with whom he came in contact. While his new friends were at dinner, Joe strolled over to where Colonel Zane sat on the doorstep of his home. "'How did you get on with the boys?' inquired the Colonel. "'All right, I hope. Say, Colonel Zane, I'd like to talk to your Indian guide.' Colonel Zane spoke a few words in the Indian language to the guide, who left his post and came over to them. The colonel then had a short conversation with him, at the conclusion of which he pointed toward Joe. "'How do, shake,' said Tome, extending his hand. Joe smiled and returned the friendly hand pressure. "'Shawnee, catch him? asked the Indian in his fairly intelligible English. Joe nodded his head, while Colonel Zane spoke once more in Shawnee explaining the cause of Silvertip's enmity. "'Shawnee, chief, one bad engine,' replied Tomei seriously. "'Silvertip, mad, thunder mad. Catch em pale face, scalp em sure.' After giving this warning, the chief returned to his former position near the corner of the cabin. "'He can talk in English fairly well, much better than the Shawnee brave who talked with me the other day,' observed Joe. Some of the Indians speak the language almost fluently, said Colonel Zane. You could hardly have distinguished Logan's speech from a white man's. Corn Planter uses good English, as also does my brother's wife, a Wyandot girl. Did your brother marry an Indian? And Joe plainly showed his surprise. Indeed he did, and a most beautiful girl she is. I'll tell you Isaac's story some time. He was a captive among the Wyandots for ten years. The chief's daughter, Mayura, loved him, kept him from being tortured, and finally saved him from the stake. Well, that floors me, said Joe. Yet I don't see why it should. I'm just surprised. Where's your brother now? He lives with the tribe. 
He and Mayura are working hard for peace. We are now on more friendly terms with the great Wyandots, or Hurons, as we call them, than ever before. Well, who is this big man coming from the fort? asked Joe suddenly, observing a stalwart frontiersman approaching. Major Sam McCulloch. You have met him. He's the man who jumped his horse from yonder bluff. Jonathan and he have the same look, the same swing, observed Joe, as he ran his eye over the major. His faded buckskin costume, beaded, fringed, and laced, was similar to that of the colonel's brother. Powder flask and bullet pouch were made from cow horns and slung around his neck on deer hide strings. The hunting coat was unlaced, exposing under the long fringed borders a tunic of the same well-tanned but finer and softer material. As he walked, the flaps of his coat fell back, showing a belt containing two knives, sheathed in heavy buckskin, and a bright tomahawk. He carried a long rifle in the hollow of his arm. "'These hunters have the same kind of buckskin suits,' continued Joe. "'Still, it doesn't seem to me the clothes make the resemblance to each other. The way these men stand, walk, and act is what strikes me particularly, as in the case of Wetzel. I know what you mean, the flashing eye, the erect poise of expectation, and the springy step. Those, my lad, come from a life spent in the woods. Well, it's a grand way to live. Colonel, my horse is laid up, said Major McCulloch, coming to the steps. He bowed pleasantly to Joe. So you're going to Short Creek? You can have one of my horses. But first come inside, and we'll talk over your expedition. The afternoon passed uneventfully for Joe. His brother and Mr. Wells were absorbed in plans for their future work, and Nell and Kate were resting. Therefore he was forced to find such amusement or occupation as was possible in or near the stockade. End of Chapter 8 of The Spirit of the Border by Zane Gray Recording by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio.